Hello, everyone. Oh, this mic is so animated. Hi. <laughs> How are y'all doing tonight? Thank you so much for coming for our presentation of our Mississippi Freedom Project. You should have seen the link at the front. It's the same one on the screen. So please sign in if you have not yet, just so that we can know you're here and get some contact for you. And thank you for coming again. Um, first thing, there is food over there. Feel free to grab it at any point throughout the event. It will continue to be there. And for the rest of the welcome, please give a round of applause for the director of our Samuel Proctor Oral History Program, Dr. Ortiz. Thank you so much, Kristen. So tonight is really focused on how we do learning off campus. How many of you would like to find a way, if you're a student, to get off campus? Okay, so that's one of the things you're going to be hearing about when we get to the student panel. My name is Paul Ortiz. I am the proud director of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program, professor of history here at UF. And it's, I'm just so excited and thrilled to, to have all of you come in today. Um, I see a lot of familiar friends. I see veterans of, of the Mississippi Freedom Project trip in past years. Um, I see a lot of people who seem like they might be excited about the prospect of going to the Mississippi Delta and also thinking about other field work projects because the Proctor program at UF is one of the leading oral history programs in the country, especially in terms of getting students to work with different communities to do direct oral history, public history projects to help churches, synagogues, mosques collect their own histories, start their own community archives, and not just in Florida, but really all over the country and increasingly in different parts of the world. So we would love to have you join us. And there's so many different ways you can possibly join us, you know, both as students, parents, instructors, uh, fellow travelers, et cetera, et cetera. As we begin, and as we're kind of getting situated again, just to echo what Kristen said in the, in the beginning, um, we do have food. Um, we have a lot of things in the front desk too that we want to give away to you. And I'll talk about one of them in just a moment. I would like to start with a indigenous Native American land acknowledgement. Uh, we believe this is very important here. We want to recognize on the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program that UF and our entire state, and especially this region, is established on the historic territories of the Timucua people and crossroads of Native American peoples who have long inhabited this land. The main campus of UF is on the Timucua, Batano, and Seminole ancestral lands. The Samuel Proctor Oral History Program acknowledges our obligation to former past and present and future native Floridians. So thank you very much. I was asked to talk about how the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program ended up in the Mississippi Delta. And if you had told me back in 1995, when I was a history PhD student at Duke University, that I would be standing in front of an audience of really cool people talking about the 15th, is it the 15th anniversary of the Mississippi Freedom Project uh, uh, trip? If you'd have told me back in 1995 I would be doing that today, I would say, you are crazy. How on earth could you even imagine that? So you have to imagine me, a, or a younger version, a younger, lighter version of me, back in 1995 in graduate school, a lean, hungry grad student. And I was part of a National Endowment for the Humanities sponsored oral history project titled, and it's a mouthful, let me see if I can get it right, Behind the Veil, 
documenting African-American life in the Jim Crow South. And we were based at the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke University. And our charge was to go to communities all throughout the South and to interview African-American elders about their experiences coming of age in the Jim Crow South before the modern civil rights movement. So in other words, people who grew into adulthood in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and the idea was to gain as much knowledge as we possibly could from them. And it was just an incredible opportunity for me to be a part of that project. And my job was to essentially do research, to set up each of the research sites. We did oral history uh, sites, uh, one of the places, Macon County, Alabama, in what used to be called the Black Belt of the state. Very historic, the founding place of the Tuskegee Institute, founded by who? Booker T. Washington, thank you. And so many other parts of the South, one of them, Leon and Gadsden County, Florida, uh, or Florida in the singular. So I ended up in the Mississippi Delta team the summer of 1995, and I was, we were based in Mississippi Valley State University, and we were interviewing elders from all over the region. But one day I went to do an oral history interview, and I took the wrong turn, and I ended up in a small town called Indianola, Mississippi. Now, I had never been to Indianola, but I knew about it because if you know anything about the civil rights movement, it's one of the most pivotal, important small towns in the history of this entire hemisphere. On one evening, five different African-American-owned businesses and houses were bombed by the Ku Klux Klan. This has been in the subject of many movies. Because the movement power there, the movement center was so strong. And to, to accidentally end up there was, was this incredible thing. And I stopped at the first place I could see, which was called White's Service Station. It was owned by Dorsey White. He was an African-American business person. His wife had been heavily involved in the movement. I just pulled in. There were a lot of, a lot of men working on cars in the service center. And I said, excuse me, sir, I'm lost. Uh, can you help me? And he said, okay, you know, where do you need to get to? Oh, and by the way, uh, what are you doing here? You know, what, what are you up to? And I told him I was doing African-American oral history interviews. He said, oh, I can connect you to a lot of people, young man, if you have the time. I said, sure. So I spent the next two weeks under the direction of Dorsey White, who ran White Service Station that fixed cars, it was Mechanic Center, and went all the way up and down the Mississippi Delta to do these oral history interviews. And what he would do was he'd call a friend and he would tell me, okay, go four miles down Highway 49 and take a right when you get to County Road 256 and you'll see a barn, stop there and someone will meet you. Okay, I did that for two straight weeks. And what was so incredible was how people welcomed me into their communities. That's the kind of experience I'm trying to replicate for my students today. When I did oral history work in Gadsden County and Leon County, Florida, I got a call late one evening. This was the summer before the Mississippi Freedom Project, uh, or uh, before my work in the Delta. And the person calling me had been one of the critical civil rights movements and uh, civil rights movement leaders in Tallahassee, Samuel Dixie Sr. And he said, Paul, where are you staying at? And I said, well, I'm, you know, I'm a grad student, so I'm staying at the Econo Lodge in the edge of Tallahassee. He said, well, Paul, you know, you've been asking some really tough questions about the Ku Klux Klan, about lynching, and you've riled up a lot of the old white, white Klan veterans. I think you need to stay with me and Mrs. Dixie and um, for your own good, for we, we want to protect you. Now, at the time, I didn't realize that when Dr. King would go to Tallahassee in the 50s and early 60s, he would stay with Mr. and Mrs. Samuel and Laura Dixie because they could defend him. And when I say they could defend him, I think you know what I'm talking about. They're in the middle of a black working class neighborhood. 
I didn't know that at the time. But he said, yeah, we want you to come and stay with us. And I said, well, you know. He said, no, 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 this is not a conversation. I'm coming to pick you up. So from that summer on, I stayed with Sam and Laura Dixie whenever I went to Gadsden and Leon Counties to do oral histories because they wanted to make sure that I was safe and that I wouldn't be threatened physically or otherwise. So again, all I try to do with this trip, and, and day one, as the students can tell you, we stop at the home of Sam and Laura Dixie. Now they passed on, but their son and daughter-in-law and grandkids are still there. So tonight, a lot of the stops on the trip you'll hear about are kind of led by children and grandchildren of the people that I knew and met as a grad student in when I was at Duke. And I'm just so grateful. We have a couple of community partners who are going to be speaking in a few moments. They're the ones that really make this trip because very few of us here, how many people here are from the Mississippi Delta? Right? So who's going to host us? Who's going to put up with us? Who's going to connect us to elders who want to talk? Who's going to invite us in? So that kind of field work, which I'm just so excited about, has led to so many incredible outcomes for our students. The students that have that are veterans of this trip have went on to thrive. They have become teachers. They have become attorneys. They've become labor organizers. They've become entrepreneurs. They become museum professionals. All of the above. And so as a professor, I have to always be thinking about how do I help my students get to the next level? And this program and all of our field work programs are designed with that in mind. But most important is the question and the issue of community. And that's what you hear about a lot tonight. And I think I've got, uh, Donovan has given me my card here. And so I think I will give the microphone back to our MC. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So as Dr. Ortiz mentioned, it really rely, like requires the members of community allowing us to come into their homes, to their spaces, and introduce us to the people who have the stories to tell. So we now have two of our community partners here on Zoom joining us from different parts. Um, and that would be Dr. Olson and Mr. Rubin. Thank you so much for being here with us. Dr. Olson works with us when we were in Elaine, Arkansas and Mr. Rubin in Holly Springs, Mississippi. So we can start with Dr. Olson. Thank you. I want to tell you how, not just how good it is to have you come. You've been here three years now and you're like family. When the Samuel Proctor groups come, we welcome you like relatives coming home. And when you leave, we're sorry to see you, see you leave. But when you're here, you are recording stories that are not just nice, they are impacting. You are in an area when you are here that is not, not always safe. There's a tension going on here between the stories, the written stories of the white supremacists cotton empire builders and their descendants today, and the oral stories of African-Americans, stories of owning land, of being business people, educators, succeeding in life. The whole area was black owned. And in three short days, the land was gone, many were killed, others fled, and people became poor in many cases became sharecroppers on the very land they had owned a few days earlier. The other story, the white supremacist story, the cotton empire builders and their descendants is attempting to revise the story. They used to say 800 were killed, then it went to 233, and now it's maybe under 100 die. They're trying to make heroes of the people who were doing the killing. And so as you take and share the oral stories, you are helping the truth be known, preparing the way for reparations and restitution and bringing a people out of poverty. 
I'm here speaking to you today because the descendants are next door. With the lawyer who is here, she will spend four months here documenting the oral stories, many of which you took, documenting them in the courthouse. We've discovered that it's not true. The documentation isn't there. It's just nobody's spent the amount of time it takes to find it. All black owned and now changed. When you came last summer, you went into Helena, 25 miles away, and found that the story of the descendants of the Cotton Empire builders is strong. It's a story of sharecroppers and labor, as if everybody here was poor before 1919. And so nobody has to face how the land got stolen and who stole it. So you're in the middle, not just of taking oral stories of the past, you're in the middle of a struggle today for truth, for equality, equity, and justice. We thank you so much for coming because it has also helped open up the community to telling stories after you leave, to feel free to talk about the stories that have been very carefully passed from generation to generation to generation. Those stories now being documented will live on as truth. Thanks so much for coming to Elaine, Arkansas. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Olson. And next we will have Mr. Rubin, who is our community partner in Holly Springs, Mississippi. And hi, Jonathan. Um, to meet the mark. I am actually Ruby. on a bus right now here in uh, Selma, Alabama. Is the person who organized this group? Oh, there it comes. Uh, so, if, if, um, if you all would would lead us, um, we we walk slowly and silently, and just. <laughs> The group is yeah, just yeah. about to uh, walk uh, across the Edmund today. Edmund Pettus Bridge and think about here in Selma. Yeah. Uh, and um, many, many, unfortunately, because we started a little bit late here, here for us. Um, just as we stood on we're the having a little bit of a uh, conflict. Of the, can you hear me? Can you hear what I'm about? Okay, great, great. Um, so yeah. I'm pardon the uh, background. Uh, noise, but people here are just as enthusiastic about what they're doing you have to go up the now. The students so were enthusiastic when they came to well, Holly Springs. So uh, I wanted to say that no, we will pick you up on the Holly Springs, Mississippi, has always been a center of resistance. But some people to uh, oppression, to uh, slavery, to the, the um, to the black yeah. codes, so the segregation, the Jim to Crow. Up the top of the bridge, um, and it's, it's where uh, Ida B. Wells grew up, and what where she went to college, which is Rust College. Yeah, um, yeah. Holly Springs started out as the headquarters of the cotton industry in Mississippi. It was always the business area. It's uh, located just south of Memphis, Tennessee, uh, and when basically what happened was. When the plantation owners in Georgia and the Carolinas and Virginia ruined the soil there, uh, they sent their, you know, their do wells, brother in laws, uh, west to uh, start mm -hmm. ruining the soil there. Uh, uh, I don't know. Can you hear the singing going on in the background? Okay, maybe we'll just hear the singing for a bit. Oh, 
I find my hands on freedom plow. Wouldn't trade my big one with charity now. The people on this house. bus uh, are about to um, disembark and walk across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Uh, in Selma, which is right to my right here. Uh, but I'm going to try to uh, finish the story about Holly Springs. Uh, as I said, Holly Springs has always been an area of resistance, first to slavery, into uh, various oppressions suffered by uh, Black people for 400 years. Uh, but People here um, kind of used to getting, or I should say in Holly Springs, are kind of used to getting a good uh, too. And uh, their yeah, lifelong uh, contributions to the movement are often overlooked because people look to the Delta and itself story uh, and, and not to northern Mississippi. Think about other. And then the group from this bridge Sam Proctor Project came. It and was the first time many of them got to sell their, their stories. And it was very, very empowering for them just to tell their stories. Um, and since then, the moments on the bridge, uh, when when or some people as in any meditation gave their our attention is called have been reinvigorated. Have been Here we are. Really enthused about jumping back into the mood temptation um, and doing the tasks that need to be done today, particularly with the return of out-and-out -out racism, voter suppression, and all the other um, problems that are and barriers as a reflection. Terrible setting back the clocks that are affecting Black people today. When the students came, it was a major, major boost to the energy of people in Holly Springs. I said earlier, you know, um, anthropologists learned early that when they go into villages in the uh, Amazon or so and talk to the people there, that their very presence changes things. They're not just uh, those people that carry uh, tape recorders or such. Their presence changes the nature of the community. And in this case, the students coming to Holly Springs changed the community in a positive way. The community has been changed since you all left. And I was saying earlier that now people already are signing up. They want to be interviewed next time you come. Um, since you left, uh, the, the people that you interviewed, um, have started an organization called Mississippi Roots and Wings um, that are determined to tell the story of the Black community in general, just like they were telling their own stories in, in specific. Uh, and that story is going to start with um, celebrations that started in slavery times uh, that present and promote the history of the era african-american community in holly springs but it's going to be open to everybody particularly the white community and we're hoping that that's going to be a um a point of both healing but of more than that of progress uh in, in communities uh, they're talking about mentorship programs for students at russ college uh because they're finally realizing that they have an important thing to present to the students of Russ College, which is an HBCU in Holly Springs. It's the oldest HBCU in the country. And that story is about their own struggle uh, against the effects of segregation. And they didn't realize in many cases how important that was until you all came. So I want to um, just echo what uh, uh, Sister Mary said, Thank you very much for coming, and we're looking forward to your coming back soon. Thank you so, so much to both of you. 
um, and on what they were mentioning. In the back of our um, MFP guide, you can find the itinerary. And this is last year's itinerary. So Holly Springs, where uh, Mr. Rubin is referencing, is not in this itinerary. But when the one from this year comes out, you'll see it. But Elaine is also in there, which is where Dr. Olson is. So thank you again to our partners. Um, next, we're going to go into student reflections. And we have four students, past students from MFP, who are here and are going to share each of their individual experiences with you. So please welcome our first one, Alexandra Leon. Hi everyone, how are you guys doing? So my name is Alexandra Leon and I am a second year history major here at UF. I also have a minor in education studies and I just wanted to kind of like go off of the basic question that we've had and for me and like some of my other colleagues to, you know, build off and give you kind of like a background about what this is about. So. How did I hear about the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program? Why did I apply? I had heard from one of my mentors, um, an alumna of UF. She wasn't a history major, she was an anthropology major, but she was telling me about SPOP and basically the premise that students would travel across the country and get these interviews and, you know, do all these amazing things and archive this information. So I'd been interested in applying for the MFP trip since like before my freshman year, you know, it was one of the things that I wanted to do. I wrote it on my, my little like planning papers. Um, I actually applied um, the day I applied. The applications actually closed, so there weren't any more spots. So I was kind of like, oh, I'll do it next year. Um, but I believe July, end of July, like three weeks before the trip, they like opened it up some spots. And at the last minute, I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. And it ended up literally like altering the way I view, the way I study history today. Um, so much of the people that I've met about what I'm studying now, it's just been an amazing experience. So the most memorable part, um, I believe up there, and like the lower right, you see me, two of my colleagues, we interviewed an artist at the Elaine Legacy Center who was painting a mural to commemorate the Elaine massacre um, of 1919. And in the middle, he was commemorating the Elaine 12, 12 men who died as a result um, after being placed on trial. And he was telling us about how he was taking, you know, this horrible thing that had happened and was adding, just infusing an energy of solidarity and community to it. So it was really powerful to, it's something to read these things in a textbook or online or have somebody kind of explain it to you. But it's another to be like six feet away from the person, you know, they're speaking right in front of you and you can hear their like emotions or they crack a joke and it's like you become friends with them and those like however long the interview is. So that's been something I didn't, I kind of thought about before I started the trip, but I didn't, you know, realize how impactful that would be until I interviewed this gentleman. So for the next question, um, how basically how it's affected the way I study history now, um, the way I've been looking into Gainesville's history of how similar concepts are being approached. It's a lot of information. And thanks to the community that I found with SPOP, um, it's been an honor to be able to study this and process this information slowly because, you know, I want to start falling down like a rabbit hole of like, you know, similar things that have happened in our state and like my hometown and our regions. So it's important to have, especially as a history major, to have like a support system to be able to do that. And I think if I hadn't gone on the MFP trip, I wouldn't have been able to, you know, learn that. And today I'm still volunteering with SPOP and you know transcribing interviews and i've met so many amazing people besides the content you know like the content's heavy and it's challenging 
but I wanted to like kind of end off on the note that it's also fun. You meet incredible people. I've made so many friends. Um, the food is amazing in the South, you know, because I guess like where I'm from, South Florida and then the deep South, the food's different, you know. So it was, you know, you make those connections on the hours long van rides, which can seem daunting. But, you know, it's definitely I don't regret it one bit. I'm very grateful for having done this. So thank you so much. Thank you, Alex. And our next student reflection will come from Nico Bronto. I'm gonna go up here too. Hi everyone, my name is Nico Bronto. I'm a new graduate from the University of Florida. I majored in advertising. Uh, I had a concentration in family, youth and community sciences. Any FYC people out here? FYC, yes, 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 cool, cool. All right, um, so I'm gonna go through the same list of questions. Um, I'm really thankful that I had the opportunity to come back and talk now that I've had a full year since um, I did my trip in 2021. So it was one of the first things that I did coming into um, the, not I wouldn't say post pandemic, but back when everything was opening up again. Um, so for me, um, the reason that I applied was because, um, backstory, I'm Filipino, Asian American, uh, very involved in ASU uh, when I was here at the University of Florida. I'm also part of a multicultural uh, Greek fraternity. Um, so a lot of the things that I did were based on my identities and based on a lot of the history that I have with myself and my culture. Um, and I was talking to Omar Sanchez, who was the trip coordinator, um, also part of my fraternity. And he said, maybe you should explore a little bit more um, on what you can do to contribute to a more equitable campus. And I was like, okay. I'll apply, I'm gonna do it. Uh, and I did it. And I went into it with an open mind, open heart, ready to learn. Um, and when I tell you that this was one of the most impactful things going into my senior year in the last um, couple of months of my time at the University of Florida, that's something that I want y'all to take away from this. If you even have the inkling of wanting to go apply, please, please, please apply. Um, do a little bit of reflecting and be like, do I really want to go on this trip? What is the one thing that is pulling me into this trip? And for me, it was, what can I learn so I can bring it back to my Asian American community to be, to say, this is what we can do to help Black and Indigenous people, not only on campus, but a better understanding and build community and solidarity, right? Um, so for me, one of the most memorable things of the entire trip was when we were in a lane and we went to the local cemetery and we saw the people that were the tombstones of the people that died um, in Lane over the course of from the late 1800s all the way until 2012. I think that was the, the most recent one that I saw when I was uh, recording the names of the people who had passed. Um, and just the impact of that, there wasn't a necessarily a, an official record of all of those people. And I was like, wow, this is something that we are helping to do in our own impact on this community. So that that was something that was very memorable for me. Um, and how was my study affected by MFP? It didn't change necessarily any of the coursework that I was taking, but the understanding of history in general, it definitely shift my, shifted my perspective. Um, a lot of the work that I was doing in the Asian American community was surrounded on the fact that there is a divide between Asian people and non-Asian people. Um, and Asian American people and non-Asian American people, right? So that was something that I struggled with, I grappled with, and this trip taught me that we are intertwined. This is American history. This is the history of us as a people in the United States. And we have a responsibility to learn what went on in the land that we live on, right? So even, even earlier when Dr. Ortiz was doing our land acknowledgement, until I came to the University of Florida, I didn't have an understanding of why that's important. Um, and after going on the MFP trip, I realized how crucial it is for my development um, as an individual, as someone who wants to go into organizing that it, this is so necessary for the work that I was doing. Um, and something that I brought back. So I have these two books right here. Um, so this is from the Emmett Till Historic Intrepid Center. We got signed copies of A Stone of Hope. Um, when we were getting these books signed, when uh, we were talking with the author of this book, it was 
it was a moment where I was like, I'm going to read this later and I'm going to remember that I shook his hand, that someone who had a hand in uh, not only compiling all this information, but also um, sharing this to people who might not know as much. Um, that's something that I have in my hand. And also, uh, <laughs> um, the 20 Years Unidos from the Mississippi Immigrants' Rights Alliance. Um, coming out of COVID, uh, going on this trip, it opened my eyes to how history just, it continues. Like, the world was on pause, but history doesn't, right? This was the mark of their 20 years. This was something that they celebrated in the face of a pandemic in uh, something that so many more people died. And that was its own history that it's happening. And in 10, 20, 30, 50 years, we're going to hear about how COVID affected the Deep South and how that affected uh, racial groups and like how all of that was affected by this. So when I saw this book and it was handed to our group, I saw this in my hand and I was just like, this is something to celebrate. This is something positive that came from the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, not, not necessarily from the COVID-19 pandemic, but um, despite the COVID-19 pandemic, we were able to celebrate with them and share their stories, record their history. Um, and honestly, I forgot everything that I was going to say when we were uh, <laughs> uh, rehearsing this, but I'm so happy to be here and uh, thank you. Nico, by the way, like he said, graduated, drove all the way to Gainesville just for this event. So another round of applause. Spop really means a lot to a lot of us. So thank you. Our next reflection will come from Angel McKee. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Okay, so oof, I'm going to try to like, be professional because I'm so goofy. Okay. I came on the trip. I'm like a flyer groupie. So like if I see group, like flyers for anything cool, I like grab them. And this was just one of the flyers that I grabbed one day. And then when I looked it up, um, the deadline had already passed for submissions, but I still submitted and I still got in. So that was exciting. And then I'm from the West. I'm from like the Las Vegas area. So I had done a little bit of like black history, but it's in a different context when you're not in places that are so like embedded with slavery and like history of like the South and stuff like that. Um, so to be in the physical spaces and to see some of the signs and stuff still be there and to hear the stories more as like living records than as like abstract ideas was, um, it was really enriching. It helped me a lot in my coursework. So I did the program, I took a gap year after undergrad and then I started my master's I don't think that um, I would have understood the material as much if I hadn't done this. It helped me be able to have like real, this is one of my classmates supporting me. Um, it gave me like real world like connections to the material so that when I learn about methods, I really know what works best for me as a researcher. Um, I feel like it gave me more connections between how I can incorporate like activism with academia. Um, and then I also started combining because I do a lot of creative writing and poetry. I also had I, I felt more comfortable bringing narrative prose like poetry and things like that into academia as well. I don't think that I would have felt comfortable doing that if I didn't have as much as a connection with people. If I wasn't like texting them and being able to say, can you read this? Is, is, is this does this feel right to you? Does this feel like I'm, I'm telling your story in a way that's appropriate? Am I leaving anything out? And then as far as like a physical thing to keep. Um, I keep these, um, rocks in my pocket, um, from when we were in a lane and it helps me, it helps because one of the things that stood out to me was when someone from the Elaine Legacy Center mentioned about how so many researchers and people who made documentaries and stuff came there, got their stuff and then left and never even sent like a thank you note. And it really impacted me and I wanted to make sure that I wasn't doing that. And so when I have this with me, it reminds me, it's like, I'm carrying it with me. Like it's about Elaine, it's about other places that are similar, but it just reminds me to stay grounded and to remember that like no matter what I do or no matter what I become or no matter like what career I have, that I'm staying rooted in like the collective community. Um, and then I've made a ton of friends. Um, I've gone to like a bunch of like Asian student union events and stuff because of my girl over here. Um, I've learned how much it's like important to like have the fight be of people of different majors. Um, like we have like journalism students and artists and stuff like that. Sometimes when I talk about like, sometimes if you're like ever working in like nonprofit work, it's like, not that this is, but when you are working in nonprofit work, it's very much like 
all what are we doing? But then you start to realize that there's a lot of things that you can't get to just in your field. So it was really important to see all the different ways that all the different majors brains worked and stuff like that. Um, so that we can come at the issues as like a, a whole and not just from one area. So I think that that's also really important too. I think it will also broaden the way that you look at problem solving and racism and academia as a whole. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Angel. And so uh, before I introduce the next person to preface it, uh, we don't all just go and we're students running around. Uh, we go with Spock staff, two of whom are still working right now. So thank you guys, Miss <laughs> Deborah and Adolfo went this year. And yes, a round of applause for them. You're the best. <laughs> We also have student coordinators who help plan the trip and run the trip and they're there in the rooms with us and do everything with us and up till 1 a.m. singing with us and feeling with us and everything else we do. So we're gonna have one of our student coordinators of the trip come up and share his story as well. So Ronan Hart, everybody. Hi, everybody. Yeah, so my name's uh, Ronan Hart. I'm a fourth year history major and I work at SPOP. Um, once upon a time, I was just a student kind of running around um, in my, at the end of my sophomore year, I heard about the MFP trip from my friend Rachel, who I knew through campus activism work, the fight for food justice on campus, boycott the rights, if anyone remembers that. Um, and she told me about it and I realized I had missed a deadline, but I'd just been pushed back a week. So I just threw together this application and got in. And I hardly knew what oral history really was, even though I was a history major, just it's kind of so far removed from the stuff you do in class. Um, and I had never been to the Delta, just that part of the country. I grew up in Florida, lived here my whole life, and I've traveled and seen other parts of the country, but I'd never been there. And I was just excited to see what it was like. And I was really blown away, um, both by just the place, um, the people who came on the trip, a lot of people I'm still close friends with now, um, and the, the, the people I got to talk to, these interviews that really, it, it's people you would never meet at like any other way in your life, pretty much. Like you're talking to someone and it's like, the, this is the only way this could have happened, like this conversation that we're having right now. Um, and the Delta, it, it felt like a, like a different country in some ways, but also it had like everything that makes America the country it is, good and bad there more than anywhere else I had been. It's really almost a disorienting kind of thing. And the food is delicious, like um, Alex was saying earlier. <laughs> um, so um, I would say more, more than my study being affected, um, you know, I won this and I was new to the whole thing and we had our coordinators and they were graduating and they're like, there's going to be jobs at SPOP when we leave. So I'm like, oh, okay, I could do that. So I just applied and that fall after the trip I started working at SPOP and I started going on more trips, conducting interviews, transcribing, helping set up events like this, all the wonderful stuff um, we do in the office and spending time with you know all of my amazing coworkers who I love so much in there and then got to help plan and then carry out as a coordinator this trip this summer, which was really such a rewarding experience. Like, you know, just going and having all this stuff happen the first time versus planning it and then seeing things go according to plan, but also not going to plan and kind of having to improvise. Very rewarding experience um, getting to do that. And it, I was kind of worried about like, you know, trying to like manage everybody and like, am I gonna feel like a babysitter? But no, obviously not. Everyone who went on this trip wants to go on this trip and they are so motivated and passionate and were, there to do the work and really did you know incredible jobs everyone and i'm so happy that so many of them have stayed involved and are in this room now um are up in the spot office regularly um helping with the projects that we do now um i forgot my objects i was going to show off that i brought back um i there are two books i bought from the equal justice initiative museum in montgomery which go on this trip to go to that museum or just go to the museum if you can't go on the trip, if you're ever in Montgomery. Um, it's an incredible history museum. I've been three times at this point and you get something new out of it every time. Um, but they have a great bookstore at the end and I got uh, two books um, 
one by France Fanon, one by Angela Davis, because I felt very invigorated in like the activism direction because of a lot of the people we had met, both people who were, you know, activists, like the people who worked at the Mississippi Immigrant Immigrants Rights Alliance, um, who were doing amazing work, probably the coolest lawyers I've met in my life, which sounds like a contradiction, but you know. Um, as well as all these incredible people who had participated in the civil rights movement decades ago um, and had all these stories to tell about it and, you know, what it takes to organize groups of people and make those connections and really affect change. So as like a campus activist, I just felt so inspired and I wanted to do like this reading and these these books by Fanon and Angela Davis, who you, know, you hear recommended so much. So that's why I would have brought if I had remembered them. Um, and yeah, I it's if there's one thing I want everyone to know about MFP, it's that it's free. So that's no one's mentioned that it is free. <laughs> like you, you pay for the food, you pay for the like the delicious food that you eat. Otherwise, like lodging, everything is taken care of. So <laughs> that's a, a small reason, but an important reason that you should absolutely apply. Um, and I'm happy I did. It's probably been the biggest thing to affect my college experience so far, and it's definitely changed you know, how I do things as an activist, as a history major, how I understand history, um, the difference between what's written down on paper and what actually happened and how big that difference can be and how the only way you can get to the bottom of it is by talking to people who are there, you know, when that's possible. Um, so it's, it was an incredible experience. I feel so lucky that I was able to do that and I can't recommend it enough. Thank you. Thank you, Ronan. So although that's all of the reflections that we're going to hear tonight, you all had a reflection booklet on your chair when you came in. And there is other students' reflections in there. And all of our names, including mine, is at the very back. So feel free to check those out. If there wasn't one on your seat, they're also at the table at the front where you checked in. So for our next portion, we're going to open the floor up for Q&A and bring up some more past participants that we haven't met yet. So you guys can come on up and join me. Um, but, but I will introduce them as they come on up. Yes. <laughs> Christian, thank you. Christian, Patrick, Chloe, Chris, Sebastiano, and... Eric, coming from the back. So if you have any questions that have been on your mind, and then we also still have our wonderful community partners on the Zoom. So any questions for anyone are more than welcome. Anyone want to be the brave person and put out the first question? I will. For anybody. I have some if you don't. Hi, um, thank you. So aside from how impactful the experience was for you personally and in terms of your studies overall, would any of you say there are any specific skills that you learned that you've been able to apply professionally, personally, academically, like any really specific examples? Hello? Oh. <laughs> Can y'all hear me? Okay, perfect. Um, I think that a skill that I learned over this trip is how to communicate effectively. Um, before the trip, I wasn't exactly the best talker. Um, and that sounds exactly like how it was. Um, I just uh, didn't really know how to ask a question, how to, um, and also like not ask a leading question too. Um, normally whenever you, uh, a bad interviewer comes in and uh, asks a question to have an answer. But uh, in this trip, you learn that uh, you don't really have an answer um, in mind. You really just need to go ahead and ask how their story was and uh, get whatever answer you get. Sure. I th Jesus. I think that in interviewing, you kind of understand your role as more of a facilitator than somebody that's asking questions for a specific purpose. You know, you're just opening the floor so they can tell you the story that they want to tell you. And it shouldn't be based on what you want to hear, or what your specific interest is. You know, I'm, I'm a journalist and that's kind of how I do interviews my entire life. 
So I think it took a, a couple of days for me to understand kind of what your role is in the neural history program and the kind of like patience that you require, the kind of listening that you need to do to kind of know what follow-up questions you need to ask so that they can better represent you know, the things that they experience, the things that they want to get on the record. It's ultimately about the subject. You don't matter. It's about them. And that's a very important thing to remember, I think. Ms. Jonah? Yes, please. All right, and I'm done. Thank you. Anyone else with a burning question? Also for the community partners on Zoom. Yeah. If I could jump in for just a moment, uh, can everybody see what's on the screen? Eric, Christiana, Patrick, and so on. Uh, talking about gaining skills, Sebastiano, I think, learned a lot from my puppy, Bella, which he is, he is seen with. So I just want to point out that um, not only did human beings gain from the uh, visit to Holly Springs, but some canines did. Especially was on dog duty for like six hours there. Why? Feels like six when you know you're walking around in a hundred degree Mississippi, which are are a little my little sentence like what you can teach you going on this trip is that uh, Florida might be the sunshine state, but Mississippi is the sun itself, and Arkansas too, to be honest. And yeah, and so that lovely dog you see there, Bella. See, it is something you learn. You learn to think fast and you have a house and you have people coming in and so people have schedules so you kind of have to interview them and so it's like getting on the ball so yeah that and also that dog is best tour guide i saw a few roads over there in holly springs just courtesy of dogs <laughs> excuse me shout out to shout out to bella <laughs> Um, hi, I was just wondering if you guys were all history majors or if you had like varying majors and how you got involved in SPOF. Um, since I'm holding the mic, I'll answer that question. Um, so I am a political science major. My, um, I'm actually a third year PhD student. I applied to this program because my interest is on rural political activism and my family is originally from the Delta. So I applied expecting that I would know exactly what I was getting into, that this was going to be more so a trip that kind of confirmed things that I already knew. And you find, I mean, this is where I spent my summers growing up. Like this is, you know, it wasn't like stepping into anything strange to me, but it was still much more than I expected to get from it. Um, since I am holding the mic, I do want to acknowledge while we were in Arkansas, we also spoke to the King family who are the descendants of Elaine and Macy King, who is one of the first black women political scientists passed away recently. So I, we happened to meet her. We happened to speak to her brothers and, we weren't even initially supposed to interview them. Um, we got a call, I think, from Dr. Ol Dr. Olson, who said, "You need to talk to this family before you like before you leave." It was me, Dr. Ortiz, and another student, and we just went out and spoke to them. Um, one of the greatest experiences, um, a family, you know, not much unlike my own, but. You, you just find such a richness in people's personal experiences and stories. And I think um, one thing to just keep in mind is that you, you don't know what somebody has to offer you um, in their experience. You don't know um, what to expect. And that's one of the great things about doing this work, that there's so much richness that you would have never ex expected that you find in doing this kind of work. One for each of the 12 tribes with the explanation that would be cooking on the... Okay, so I didn't want to be the stereotypical STEM major and let everyone know that I'm a STEM major, but I am a biology major, but more importantly, I'm minoring in health disparities in society. 
Um, what really pushed me to apply for this was actually one of my friends who went on this trip last year, Seju Hussein, and also I did know Nigo prior to this because of my involvement with the Asian American Student Union. Um, honestly, when I had gone on this trip, I had no expectations. I felt like I had a lot of questions from family members and just a few of my friends asking why I even wanted to go on this trip because it was in the South. And a lot of people just had such a negative outlook on the Deep South. I think a lot of people expect the South to be just full of raging white supremacists and really closed-minded conservatives. And yeah, it's part of it. Like Ronan was talking about, you have the worst, but you also have some of the best. You kind of forget that when you're talking about inequities, racial inequities, that those communities that you're trying to help are in the South. All of those Black communities that we had visited, I remember in Elaine, um, there was a community leader, Mr. Quincy. He was kind of thanking us towards the end, but explicitly stated, I don't think I'm ever going to see any of you guys here again. But that's kind of the beauty of this trip. These are people you're probably not going to see again, but they welcome you in like your family, like you've always been there and you've known them for years. Yeah, um, for me, like, I actually grew up in Georgia. I was born in Atlanta. And so, like, in Atlanta, like, they teach you a lot about, like, civil rights history. Like, for me, like, I remember back in elementary school, like, I went to a, a MLK's house. That was really cool. But, like, um, I guess, like, we didn't really learn. We just, like, accepted it. But, like, we didn't, like, understand the dark history. Like, a lot of things that happened that just, like, really, like, hidden. So, like, learning about the Lane Massacre really, like, shocked me. And just like other massacres that occurred during like the race riots of like after the World War One, and then you start learning about like your own identity and like how you belong to the American spectrum of like the entire story, and like learning about a lot of stuff of like how immigration worked like back before nineteen sixties, and like the Mississippi Delta basically like encompasses a lot like the as Paul Ortiz would say like how like the Mississippi Delta is like literally like the American core, American culture, because a lot of, like music literature literature came from it and so like for me like i'm an international studies major but i honestly wish i did like american studies or like something like it just like learning about law like the history and the culture of what the u.s is and like honestly the mississippi delta like encompassing a lot like the the struggles that people face in the u.s but also like the, the basically like the real power that people have in this country and really inspired me to like visit these communities not just like mississippi delta but like a lot of other neglected areas in the u.s like the San Joaquin Valley in California or like the Appalachian and the West Virginia. There's like a lot of communities that are just neglected and just forgotten by the US. So it just like makes me like really like really grateful to be here and learn more about the Mississippi Delta. And yeah. We had a question online that was, did you guys meet any influential people and who were they? You kind of touched on it a little bit, Chris, but anyone, you know, anyone cool? Um, so meanwhile, we figure out, you know, what our answers are. Uh, so yes, I mean, someone up there by the name of Mr. Larry Rubin, maybe had to log off, but he was actually one of the students who went from the East coast to, uh, Mississippi in the sixties as a student and organized a SNCC and plenty of these people. I mean, I just yesterday, I was looking over this interview because that's the other beauty about MFP. It's like there's so many interviews already on file. And this man is not only pretty accomplished judge, his dad was actually one of the authors of civil rights legislation. And he just casually talks about how like his dad and two other, at that point in the 60s, elected congressmen. One of them is the founder of the Congressional Black Caucus. So people are not really going to tell you all about their accomplishments but just by you being there you realize like these are some pretty serious organizer i mean the kind of work they did just freedom schools alone SNCC, any kind of organization you meet people that like i said i mean maybe if you look up their cv some of them are even more famous i mean in uh past times i know for a fact they met uh you know congressman john lewis people that you know 
Mayor Johnny Thomas. I mean, he's been mayor of Glendora for 40 years. There's plenty of quote unquote who's who's. Uh, and that's and that's sort of also part of the deal. You know, you look them up after and you're like, wow, you've done work. That's just nothing short of remarkable. So, yeah, definitely a lot of influential people. Yeah, you mentioned Mayor Thomas. I think maybe that's who comes to mind most for me. I remember he showed us around Glendora and the Emmett Till Museum. And I don't think he said the name Emmett Till once in the entire time. He always called him the child. And he really brought that point home. And it kind of gave you an understanding of that crucial moment in civil rights history more than you, know, you could ever read about or watch any documentary on because you're there at the sites. You're there at the river that they pulled him out of, the church where he was buried. Thomas is there and explaining everything to you in such like detail and like with like enwrapped in such humanism. He's also like this big commandeering presence, this voice. So it's hard to miss. Uh, but yeah, that's what stuck out most for me. Um, I think for me, I think she's actually mentioned in the MFP reflection handbook under Ronan's reflection. It was Dr. Riketty. I kind of forgot her last name, but she was like an ancient Egyptian scholar um she had gotten into college i believe the university of illinois when the civil rights act of like 1968 i believe i always mix up my years i'm not good with numbers it's yeah but when it passed so there was like a huge there's a huge influx of African-American students, at least comparatively to prior to that time, um, getting into colleges. And she was kind of talking about her experiences of racism at the college level and how this one professor was notorious for failing all African-American students. And I think she had scraped by with like a C minus when her white classmates had all received a B or higher. Um, but she had kind of talked about her experiences of growing in Chicago and being surrounded by the Black community and being protected in that Black community away from all the horrors of racism because her parents were from the South and had refused to talk to her about anything that they had experienced. And afterwards, when she had gone into college, she talked to us about joining SNCC and being an active member there and how her husband at the time was actually part of the Panther Party and had gotten murdered during his time there. Um, then she kind of talked a lot more about her journey after that, but it was just so impactful hearing about her journey as being one of the few African-Americans and few African-American women um, who were accepted into the University of Chicago in a linguistics graduate program and where she found herself and how she found herself in Egypt after that, literally studying hieroglyphics. Thank you, guys. We've got time for one more question. If no one in the room has one, we have some more. Anyone? Okay, well, for our last question, I'd like to know, how does what you studied in the Mississippi Delta relate to you here in Florida? I had to think about that one for a second. Um, well, I'm a history major, um, one of the ones, uh, one of the many, um, but um, I, I am interested in the African diaspora. Um, and there's that, ex that exists not only here in Florida, but all over the US and, um, and the rest of the Americas. And I think that should be uh, studied in some more detail. Um, and a lot of history is oftentimes unwritten um and that's when oral history is you know it's just a beautiful thing um because you can really just hear stories um and there's a lot of there's a lot of crit criticism about it um saying that it's unreliable um it's an unreliable method but i think it's a, a really effective way to um to hear a story um that was never written down officially or documented um and that's a way that i try to incorporate um some of my own uh work um that's how I got inspired by this trip. Well, I think as Dr. Ortiz talked about, you know, the Mississippi Delta is this, has this huge weight in American culture and history and Americana, but that doesn't mean all those stories worth telling come from the Delta. You know, there are stories in your own communities and the cities we're from and the state we're from. I love Florida and it's got me thinking about the places I would want to go to Florida to do this. And, you know, we're talking later, 
really about the, the condescension you get from other people about the deep south or about florida and when you go up north and tell people they're from florida they'll literally say i'm sorry and it makes me want to throw a brick at their head <laughs> so and just i think it got me thinking about what i owe my community kind of what i owe my state and the stories that i want to document how important that is for I don't know, getting things on the record, because maybe it can't help people in the moment, but it's something that is just there. It's there forever. It can help whoever needs it later on. And it kind of all adds up in building this kind of kaleidoscope of a story. Um, I, I can't say that it has changed much of my focus since this has been my focus for the last three years and will continue until this dissertation is written. But all right. Um the but what i will say um that i have become more cognizant of is um the way in which we tend to prior prioritize knowledge within the academy um it, it's made me much more intentional in gathering those stories from um from marginalized folks above all to um, change the way we see um, knowledge and trying to erase that power dynamic that exists within it. Um, I'm sure that's probably a somewhat controversial statement, but I find it to be true um, that uh, so much of what we do in the academy is, is based on power. So being aware of that, being intentional about that, making sure the voices that I amplify are, um, you know, are, are of folks who, who haven't been able to do so themselves. And, and just to, I, I, th I think, keep that in mind as much as possible. I think everybody um, here has mentioned some version of that, but keeping that in mind as we go into our different disciplines and um, whatever we do after this, just keeping keeping folks who have been excluded in mind and all that we do. In terms of this, my take has to do a lot with how I had been able to be exposed to a lot of this material for the better part of almost four years before I finally went. And so you can actually just today, just go on the YouTube channel and listen to these people, hear some of their stories. Uh, and just the fact that they echo that far already, that's just a testament. So even that, that's what I'm going to say about that. No, you're good. Oh, and uh, everybody should know the name Margaret Block, like B-L-O-C-K. That's one that I got to say that before. Okay. And bring a hat or two because it's hot. Thank you guys so much. A round of applause for our panelists, please. Yay. As he was mentioning, all of our interviews are available for you to use and find anywhere. So everything we do at MFP is on the UF Digital Collection. You can also find it on our YouTube page, which is SPOP, S-P-O-H-P, one, one, one. We have an Instagram, which is also Spop, and we have a podcast coming out soon. And I will have Adolfo, one of our Spop staff, come up to tell you guys more about that podcast and the work that we are doing here at Spop right now. Yay, thank you. All right, thank you, everyone. Um, so I'll try to keep it short and crisp. I know you guys have been here over an hour. And but uh, there are a couple of things that I want to mention. First of all, I think throughout the public program, uh, especially in the beginning and towards the end, middle and end, we heard something, a special theme, community. Community is something that uh, gets built up throughout the field work that we do. We're not just collecting the interviews. We're not just grabbing from the communities and creating something uh, such as transcripts, but it's much more than that. It's much more personal. And that's the sense of community that we've all heard throughout today's uh, reflections. Uh, but with that said, what I what I want to move on to is like, what do we do next? We we're, help, we're we're trying to help out other communities, but what are we doing here in Gainesville? And I think that's a very important question. And that brings me up to the next thing. 
Uh, this past year, we were able to work on a specific grant, uh, which was through the Advancing Racial Justice Through Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Access at UF. And thanks, and because of that, we actually put in a proposal on time, submitted that, and luckily, we were able to get that uh, grant out. And the grant is called Challenging Racism at UF, um, and using history to create a welcoming uh, university in a vibrant intellectual atmosphere. So what does that mean? How, how do we challenge racism at the university? A way to challenge that is if you go right in the front over there in the back, you're going to see a timeline. First, you have to understand where are we standing at? You gotta know the legacy of exclusion. How do you get to learn that? Go to the back table. You'll see where it all begins. It didn't start yesterday. It didn't start a decade ago. It started a couple centuries ago. So I would suggest go over there, you know, interact with it. Learn about things you probably did not know. We're always talking about like the negative things about, about what's happening, how we're excluded from the narrative. But what about the victories? The victories collectively working together to fight and to get whatever we want to get. And at that point, I would say we've done a pretty good job at UF, but obviously there's always much more that we could do. That means raising the, raising the levels of faculty, black faculty, Latino faculty in the institution. We're talking here right now at five to 10 percent, uh, five percent faculty. That's pretty low. We need to be raising those things, those numbers. How do we do that? We challenge. How do you challenge? Let's learn from our predecessors the things that they've done and mobilize ourselves collectively. So that's a, those are just some of the deliverables that we have for the challenging racism that we've been working on. A timeline where we're trying to put how we've been impacted, minorities have been impacted at, at the institution. We're also building a documentary on top of that 10 minute short documentary, but we're also uh, building on a podcast which we're about to play for you in a couple of moments. And um, that's just an introduction to, for the podcast, three minutes, bear with me, and let's give it a shot. And what I recommend, if we could go back to the slide, the previous slide, um, what I would suggest, take a picture of the QR code. Uh, okay, yeah, so just go in the front and get the paper, take a flyer, and because of this grant, we were able, now we're able to do more, much more public programs throughout the year. So we're right now up to six, seven. This is the first one where we're unleashing the series, Challenging Racism, racism at UF. And over there, like I said in the back, there's more information on that. And so right now we're gonna play a short clip of the podcast so you know the type of material that we're dealing with and a little bit more of background about the institution itself. So let's play that, please. Hello, hello. We're your hosts, Donovan Carter. Kristen Anderson. And Sophia De La Cruz. And on behalf of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program, or SPA, we'd love to welcome you back to our podcast. The Spotcast. And to the first episode of our new series called Challenging Racism at UF. This is the first of several episodes that will examine how the University of Florida has challenged racism. The goal of this podcast series is to bring awareness to UF's history and shine a light on the legacy of exclusion and racism on and around UF campus. The series will focus on select events and focus on leaders at the forefront of efforts to combat racism, address exclusionary practices, and create an equitable environment for all. The Challenging Racism at UF series will provide an understanding of the culture of whiteness and the lack of support that minorities dealt with. For this first episode, three events will be discussed that remain hidden by the institution and the city of Gainesville. We'll begin in 1917 with the shooting of Anthony Goins by J.K. Fuller. Following this, we will discuss the hatred of the Ku Klux Klan and the kidnapping and mutilation of Catholic priest Father Don Connolly. And lastly, the Florida versus Boston college football game, where star running back Lou Montgomery was forcefully benched. The common thread between these events is that no perpetrator ever faced repercussions by law enforcement or UF administration. To understand the culture of exclusion at UF, one must go back and study the foundations of the institution and the core policies that made it inherently racist. Before diving into these three events, it's helpful to put UF's physical establishment and political foundations into context. On July 2nd of 1862, the United States Morrill Land Grant College Act enacted in the U.S.'s sale of land both legally ceded and illegally seized from Native Americans. These areas of land were called land grants. The act made it possible for states to establish public colleges funded by the development or sale of those federal land grants. If sold, the proceeds would go to fund higher education or land itself to be used for development. 
Over 10 million acres provided by these grants were expropriated from tribal lands of Native communities, furthering settler colonial expansion. The sale of 90,000 acres from 120 tribes across nine states funded the creation of many colleges, like the Florida Agricultural College in Lakeland in 1884, one of UF's primary predecessors. By June 5th of 1905, UF signed the Buckman Act, which reorganized public higher education in the state. The goal of Buckman's bill was threefold and intended to, one, condense the number of state-funded institutions of higher learning. Two, place the consolidated institutions under the authority of the governor-appointed Board of Control. And three, create gender-segregated schools for white students. Through this, the University of Florida inherited and maintained systemic racial inequality in education, politics, and the economy that was designed to keep Floridians of color in a position as second-class citizens. This inequality was enforced by a degree of anti-Black violence in Northern Florida, particularly in Alachua County, that stood out even by the gruesome standards of the rest of the South, with Florida having the highest per capita lynching rate in the nation. All right. So that's part of the introduction, uh, just so the podcast, 16 Minute Podcast, but hopefully you're able to hear it. Follow us on Spotify and it should be out there. With that said, we do have seven upcoming um, series, Challenging Racism at UF series. Uh, I asked professors to let their students get some extra credit to participate in this. This is, this is very important. Um, we also asked, we're looking for participants that, of students that want to participate, help us out uh, during those public programs. So all of you are welcome to join in and be part of this. Uh, with that said, I'm going to pass it uh, to the director, Dr. Paul Ortiz. All right, Adolfo, thank you so much. And as we're kind of moving towards the conclusion of the pro, I really don't want to leave, to be honest. I mean, I want to hear more stories. Uh, but let's give all the panelists a round of applause. Um, to echo what Adolfo said, the Challenging Racism uh, Project is really, a, again, a student-led project which takes up the challenge that you've heard from a lot of the panelists, which is how do we learn, or how do we take what we learn in the Mississippi and Arkansas Deltas and really implement it here in Gainesville, here at the University of Florida? You know, how do we talk not just about oppression, but about decades and generations of struggles that are just so very important to remember? Um, tonight is also very special to me personally and I'm going to get very emotional um, because tonight is also a night that we want to remember um, a dear student who uh, means so much to this program. And as you walked in, you may have picked up the announcement for the Henry J. Alvarez Memorial Fund. Um, Henry was a young man who approached us several years ago. And as you can kind of guess from these different student narratives, the students that walk through our doors um, are searching. They're looking for something. And many of them are actually not satisfied with the current status quo. Is that kind of accurate? They want to ask questions. And as you've heard, I'm just so proud of them they don't want to just give the answers. They want to go out there and learn from people. And Henry Alvarez was one of those students. Henry was brilliant. He was so kind. He was passionate. And he was searching. And Henry went on several spot field trips. And he was a leader. And in a moment, we're going to pay, uh, play a clip for you um, that highlights some of Henry's work. He went with us to St. Augustine, Florida, at a very tense and difficult time. And a number of students had approached the Proctor program and had said to, to me, you know, what's going on over there? You know, why is all this, there all this controversy about this con one Confederate monument? What's going on? And so as oral historians, what we do is we say, let's go find out. So Henry was one of the leaders of that trip. 
and it was very challenging because as we were interviewing people, individuals, there were some individuals who were saying, we need to take the Confederate monument down, put it in a cemetery, take it out of the public view. It currently was at the, um, the, the downtown public square in St. Augustine. Other people were saying, no, that monument is part of my heritage. I had people who fought for the Confederacy during the Civil War, so it shouldn't be moved. Into the middle of that whirlwind steps Henry Alvarez. And you'll see a clip where he's talking, and Henry was able to interview people from all sides. And he had such a compassionate ear for listening that he was able to elicit very honest answers. When I, when I go back and, and I, I listen to the interviews that Henry did, I'm just struck by how he made people feel at ease with themselves. And so what we want to do now is just play a clip for you. And again, to um, remind you how important that Henry Alvarez is to this program. And we started in the family, and I, I do want to acknowledge um, that his mother, Ms. Alvarez, is here. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you. Mrs. Alvarez, did you want to say anything? I don't want to put you on the spot, but. Dr. Ortiz, and thank you for inviting me. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting, the comments that you made. Henry, at a very young age, had a love of history. So it wasn't a surprise that he would pursue his academic career in history. Um, but it had to be at University of Florida. We have a long legacy of Gator grads in the Alvarez family. But it was during that, when he became a part of this program, that we saw him both personally, intellectually flourish. And sitting with this group tonight and hearing these stories just really reinforces my family's commitment and several members of, of Henry's family are on the Facebook link to really support and, and commit our family to supporting this program. Because again, even when he pursued his master's degree, it was these stories that he spoke to of being part of this program. And one thing that I'll leave with you is our family always says life is stories. So we are committed to this program on the long haul. And I want to thank you, Dr. Ortiz, other members of this program for everything that you gave to Henry and his memories within this program will live with us forever. So thank you. And I can't believe I did that without crying. So thank you very much. Okay, we're going to play this clip and you'll see uh, some of Henry's work. Hello, my name is Henry Alvarez. I'm with the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. I'm sitting here with Clarence in St. Augustine. Um, so Clarence, what do you think about the, uh, the Confederate monument um, debate that's going on right now in the city? I wish, wish to keep all the monuments here. There are people here that have relatives listed on those monuments and it should be kept here. Hi, my name is Henry Alvarez. I'm with the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program, and I'm here in St. Augustine with Kenneth. Uh, Kenneth, how are you doing today? Um, why are you here today? I'm basically here to protest the monuments that have been long expired in St. Augustine. Uh, they had a, a lease on it for 100 years. The lease has been expired. Plus, they revered the, the segregation in the Confederacy of um, the United States. What are you going to do with your history degree? You going to teach? No, I, that's why I, I related to you when you talked about. Uh, I don't think I, I would. No. I understand, uh, but I know that I uh, keep getting involved in kind of programs like these. You think you're going to go on and get next degree? Yeah, I'm definitely going to go to try to get the master's, the MA. Same. Yeah. Same school. Uh, hopefully, yeah. I mean, I'm definitely going to apply to the University of Florida and a couple other schools just in case they don't know. They don't take me back. I don't have I don't have what you said like I related earlier about being a not being not being able to be a teacher. 
but I know I want to be a historian. It's just a matter of how I'm going to right. a- uh, apply it, yeah. you know, in a career sense. Yeah, so that's the end of the questions I have. If there's anything you okay. want to add on to it, anything else you'd like to say? I don't know. This is very interesting. Yeah. Uh, what you folks do, would you tell me a little bit more about your program and why you folks do yeah. this? And yeah, what, you know. So the premise of the program is to go to places like this and to um, gather uh, histories of, from people that are, had been there at the time. Okay. And it's kind of histories that maybe would be lost in, you know, history books and like that. Okay. Um, and specific on the population and, and what they experienced at the time. And it's kind of, you know, as generations pass, those are kind of histories that we'll be, we'll be losing. So it's oh more about um, just the general history of the people. Well, good. Yeah, and it's, you know, I mean, your story specifically was incredibly interesting, so. Yeah, it's very good. good and very good of you folks no, to do yeah. this. And, Thank you. and I'm glad to see that there are young people yeah. that are growing up that are interested enough to find out yeah. about histories. Anyway. So yeah, I mean, I think uh, we've covered everything I needed to get. I mean, it's, okay. I, I want to I want to thank you as well because uh, for for being able to do this. And, oh, oh, that was no problem. Yeah, I enjoyed it. And, yeah, uh, and I if you ever if, if you ever in math, you look me up. But, uh, well, I mean, I think we should be there next year, so if we are, I'm definitely going to get... Yeah, come back this day and look me up, yeah. But it was nice talking with you, and, and good luck to you. You too, thank you very yeah. much. Have a yes, good sir. Day. Take care. Bye. Thank you. And again, but we've had, I'm just so grateful again that you've stayed through the whole uh, entirety of the program. We may have a little bit of food left, but again, just to reinforce what's been said earlier, um, if you're interested in the oral history program on any level as a student, um, as a parent, as a faculty member, um, or just you want to know more information, please go ahead and sign up. And um, yeah, we would love to work with you. Uh, we'll be here. Uh, we're just so honored to be in the same space with languages above us with the Bob Graham Center on the same floor. And uh, I see the experiential learning coordinator, Kevin Bird, back there to say, hey, to Dr. Bird. Thank you, Dr. Bird. You're supposed to applaud. Okay. <laughs> I say that because he was one of my, my most recent history PhD student. Uh, I'm just so very proud of him and a native of Macomb, Mississippi, and where he did his dissertation on. So anyway, thank you so much this evening. Um, as my students know, I'm, I'm in danger of beginning the history prof ramble, so I'll kind of cut it off now. So thank you so much and, and be well. Oh, Kristen, you may have. Yes, as he said, thank you guys so much for coming and staying. We know you've been here this long, but please do check out the timeline. This is a people's history of Gainesville. This was made by students and SPOP staff, and it continues across over there. We also have the Challenging Racism timeline in the back that Adolfo mentioned, and there's two of those. And we have multiple, multiple things on the table where Ronan and Angel are sitting. So feel free to ask them or any of us about what all of these multitude of things are. But basically, we just really passionate about history <laughs> and would love if you guys could um, check out all of those things. And uh, please follow our social media and we'll see you at our next event. Thank you for coming.